Here okay. we go. So hello, everyone, and welcome to Blueprints for Belonging, the series where we explore conversations on creating intentional communities. And I'm very excited to be here with Jan Martin Bang, who is joining us all the way from Norway. And I have a little uh, intro presentation to run through, and then I'm going to give the full space over to Jan to share with us. And my apologies for getting started a bit later. Uh, we had a bit of a time zone mix mishap, but nonetheless, we will get underway with the interview that I'm very excited for. So this is the official episode one of Blueprints for Belonging with our guest today, Jan Martin Bang, who I'll be introducing more shortly. And this event is being hosted on StreamYard. We're also live streaming to Facebook and YouTube and a bunch of other places. So feel free, all those folks was watching on social media, to uh, leave comments and ask questions. But specifically, those of you who have registered for the event or are part of our founder circle, you have the opportunity to ask questions and use the comment box and really engage with each other, as I know some of you have already started to do. So I encourage that. And I also encourage you, if you haven't already, to please introduce yourself briefly. I'd love to know where you're calling in from. If you live in an intentional community, let us know which one. And also let me know what you hope to learn or get out of the session. And let Jan know as well. And we'll be looking at that chat box and trying to steer our conversation to make sure that your needs get met. All right, so go ahead, find the chat box, pop in a little introduction. And while you're doing that, I'll share just a few more words about this series, the Blueprints for Belonging series, which is actually a co-production of the Foundation for Intentional Community, the FIC, and an organization that I run called Community Finders, which supports people on their path towards community living. And this is a event that we're gonna be doing um, uh, every month on the actually on the second Tuesday of each month. So I encourage you to keep coming back for it. And with the FIC, uh, it's a nonprofit organization, been around for decades supporting this movement of intentional communities, and they always welcome donations to support their work. And with Community Finders, this is actually a um, this series is sponsored by the Community Founders Circle. So if you are watching and you are have a dream inside to start an intentional community, I encourage you to check out what we're doing over at the Community Founders Circle. We did launch, uh, I think it was two weeks ago with 50, more than 50 at this point, community founders. So it's just an amazing thing to see all these people with a passion for intentional community and, and wanting to really get it started and co-create and learn along with other community founders. So that's what I have for you. And now it is my uh, great pleasure to be able to introduce Jan. Jan has a very long bio, um, which hopefully if you join this event, you got to, to read that because it's very rich and really uh, showcases much of his work over many years. So I'm just gonna pull a few things from Jan's bio. And, uh, and also share, I think it's at the end of his bio here, about being connected to the International Communities, Communal Studies Association, the ICSA. And that's an organization that Jan and I are both on the board of. And Jan was also a co-chair for a number of years. And so uh, that's how Jan and I got connected and got to meet in Denmark, which is closer to where he lives over in Norway. So Jan is a fellow of the Findhorn Foundation, was born in Norway, and grew up in England, where he was active in the cooperative and trade union movements in the 70s, and then moved to Israel in 1984 and was a kibbutz member for 16 years. And Jan, hopefully somewhere in your presentation or in our conversation later, you can touch on what the kibbutz movement is and what 
kibbutz are um because it's uh really incredible just I, i've learned through your books about the movement and some of its history and um would be helpful i think for people to understand the uh deep tradition of community living in israel uh and let's see what else uh jan has traveled extensively teaching permaculture courses um specifically in egypt turkey cyprus and the palestinian areas moved to solberg if i'm pronouncing that correctly camp hill village in norway in the year 2000 which is where Jan still lives with his family and has worked on education projects with people with first people with special needs uh, and it could be good also to explain what Camp Hill is all about, because it's also a very special network of communities. Uh, he is the administrator on the Camp Hill Charitable Network in Norway and started and edited the Norwegian Camp Hill Quarterly magazine for its first 11 years. Has worked with the Global Ecovillage Network since its establishment in 1995, which is just really incredible to uh, hear, yeah, that you were there for the early days of that network, which has now grown to be such a strong, strong global network of ecovillages. And let's see, yeah, you've been deeply involved in permaculture, gained your diploma in permaculture from the Nor Nordic Permaculture Institute. And I love how you weave permaculture and ecovillages uh, in your work and very much your books are based on viewing the community's movement from this permaculture lens, which I find very interesting. And there's probably a lot more in here, but I think I think I've touched on the main pieces and feel free to add in any important things that I may have missed. And uh, yeah, Jan, welcome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right. Welcome, everybody. And uh, first of all, I want to say it's really great to be doing this for the uh, Federation of Intentional Communities because the word intentional communities is the one that I try and use as much as possible. And not everybody really understands what, well, what are the intentional communities and stuff. So I usually start off with people who don't know. I say, well, you know, we have traditional communities. We've been having those for the last hundred thousand years um and maybe for the last twenty thousand years we'd be living in kind of villages tribes whatever you want to call it and it's tradition that has given us this rich tradition that we carry forward but in the history of that there's always been people who have said hey this is not quite good enough you know uh, we're not treating so and so right and we're not doing this right and they get a bit you know, upset and stuff. And they say, hey, you know what? Why don't we start a new community? And that's an intentional community. And if you think that, well, this started with a few hippies smoking dope in the 60s, you're absolutely wrong. Uh, they just jumped on a bandwagon that's been going on for thousands of years. So let me just quickly give you an idea of what tradition we are bearing forward into our human society uh, or societies because we have lots of them uh, the first one we know of that we could say is a traditional community uh let's see oh great it works wow technology is <laughs> amazing we love it uh, so we're going to look at youth maturity and old age um and let's start off with that before we go to the very first community that i can identify i teach permaculture uh you can this is to stay on that one I'll, I'll tell you when to switch okay okay all right I'm sorry. Um, stay on that one i teach permaculture permaculture is design so it's looking at what we want to build so i'm assuming we're talking about building communities intentional communities so let's look at the patterns in nature that might help us understand and build intentional communities in a good way now in communities are social organisms they are social organs they they are plants uh, animals human beings they are living entities in the social landscape and just like all living entities go through a life cycle 
communities also go through a life cycle. So let's be really like simple here. We can talk about youth, maturity, and old age. And we know what it's like for human beings. You know, most of us have been young at some point, and then we think we mature. You know, it's around a couple of decades in, we think we're getting mature. And by the time we're about 30, we should be fairly mature. And then, uh, believe me, when you get to my age, you're looking old age in the face. And it's okay. It's fine. It's fun. Um, it's great to be old because you get grandchildren and all that stuff happens. Plants have the same. We know what a youthful plant looks like, the first sprouts that come out. Uh, we know what maturity is because then they, they actually, just like us, they get to sexual maturity and they make seeds that make new plants. That's how that works. And we know what old age is like for a plant, and it's it's good for the for you know drying or putting in the compost heap. Um, now, communities have a similar thing, and we are going to use that as our framework in the talk. But now, give me the next picture, and I'll go back to the idea that we are bearers of a tradition. Now, the first community that we know about is called Kronos. It was founded by Pythagoras, who some of you might have heard of, in the heyday of Greek philosophy. He and Plato, you know, they hung out, probably drank beer together down, you know, uh, down in, in Athens and all that stuff. Uh, Plato carried on talking and thinking, wrote the Republic, made his name as a great thinker. And in fact, this is the first utopian literature that we know of, uh, de deliberately utopian. Uh, Pythagoras, he was a doer. He said, ah, 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 we talked enough. Come on, let's go off. Go off to uh, southern Italy, founded a community called Kronos, intentional community, very radical, like they had women in their community, not as slaves, but actually as co-workers, as partners. Uh, they say, we don't know so much about it, but we think they were um, nonviolent pacifists. Uh, we think they were vegetarians. Um, and, of course, they created a big stir. Nobody liked them because they gave women free, free rights and they didn't eat meat, you know, and all that stuff. And they wouldn't fight. And so they disappeared from history, we think. But there are streams of people who call themselves the Pythagoreans. So I'll leave you to look for those guys. They're somewhere out there doing stuff in our society. But this was an intentional community, just like Findhorn or any of those others. They went off to some barren place, built a community founded on different, different ideas from the traditional ones. So let's hop to the next slide, because this is much, much closer to us. Uh, and the diggers in England in 1649. Um, if you talk about failed communities, they lasted less than two years, or maybe, maybe a little over two years. A bunch of people who were complaining about the enclosures in England when basically the upper classes took away uh, uh, free, uh, open land, and they formed a community on um, a little hill south of London and were disbanded. Some of them were killed and the rest of them, you know, were d dispersed. They live on in a publication that comes out uh, irregularly in England called Diggers and Dreamers. And uh, St. George's Hill and Gerard Wynne Stanley are still heroes and heroic places in the commune tradition in England. But let's go closer to our uh, time with the next picture. You might have heard of Robert Owen. Robert Owen was a Welsh industrialist, the heyday of the Industrial Revolution, terrible times for people with no money. Uh, you basically had a choice. You could either starve or you can earn so little that you're going to starve anyway. Um, and he kind of didn't think this was such a great idea. And he started an intentional community called New Lanark, uh, which was based on a... Um, on, on making cloth and um, the workers were there and he wanted them to be equal partners in the business and everything was hunky-dory and then he decided he wanted to go to America because everybody wanted to go to America at that time why shouldn't he and he started a place called New Harmony based on the similar ideas uh, down in I think it's in Illinois or someplace like that in, mid, in the Midwest 
Um, and these are both big inspirations for community today. And I've been to several conferences at New Lanark about community. And the ICSA had one once there about community. And I was in New Harmony a couple of years ago with one of the great researchers into community. And uh, there is still co um, uh, conference centers and so on in New Harmony. But let's go on to closer to our time uh, because we come to Eco Villages. Now, uh, th this was really, it's just another form of community, you know, but it's community with green attached to it. Uh, and it started off with a bunch of permaculturalists. You talk about permaculture and eco villages. There was a group of people, most of whom were permaculture teachers, who in 1985, 1995 got together in Findhorn and started the Global Eco Village Network. Uh, and uh, since then, eco villages have really, you know, hit the the fan, and everybody's talking about eco villages. It's just another form of eco villages. But uh, later on in the show. I'm going to really show you uh, how we are having great breakthroughs. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next slide because we will start with a youthful community. And I have been part of a youthful community uh, uh, until it became mature and then we left. Um, and I've been visiting lots of youthful maturity, uh, youthful uh, communities. And there are certain things that are about youthful communities. First of all, everyone works really hard because you have to, because generally speaking, most people are hard up and uh, there's not uh, much. You, you can't, you know, hire a digger. You have to go and dig it by hand. And um, life is pretty hard. It's, you know, you, you, you can't take lots of time off and long holidays in exotic places. And but it's it's fun because um, in the next slide, you see not only do we work hard, but we do crazy things. Um, and this is from a, a Danish eco village. And this is a great village because they said, hey, you want to join our village? You can't take out loans and you can't bring in money. And that cuts out all the crap because the people who come, they're the ones who have no money and have to build everything themselves with their neighbors helping. It creates a new kind of um, a new kind of community. And you have to build a scrap and you have to build it together. And so you can build anything you want. They say, well, whatever you want, you can do it. And this is a great house. So we went into this house. It's truly crazy. And I thought, wow, why can't I do stuff like this, you know? Um, so it's fun. And if you look at the next slide, it's actually lots of fun being in a youthful community because they play. we play a lot. And you invent games. This is a very cheap game. It, it sticks. You, you bang sticks together. It's really cheap. You know, you can get it. You just 10 minutes in the woods and you've got all, all the bits you need. And then you stand in a circle and you, you bang sticks together. Um, and youthful communities are like that. It's spontaneous, hardworking. Everybody does everything. So um, when I was uh, in the kibbutz movement, we'll talk about kibbutz a bit later, but I joined a very young community, which was uh, the first time I was there, I was only three years old, and everybody did everything. You didn't know where you were going to work tomorrow morning. You went into the dining hall, and there was a list of workplaces. You said, oh, I'm milking cows today. Okay, I better get up to the, the milking in five minutes. You know, you have to run up there. Or you might find yourself working in the laundry or whatever. Now, this is a kind of, it's fun, exciting, and you burn out quickly because you can't keep that up for year after year after year. So if we go to the next picture, maturity means that you grow bigger and there's a lot more people. Now, a lot more people is a lot more management. You suddenly have to be a lot more professional. Like you think of doing the accounts, for you, uh, you can't even see how many people are there, but there's a lot of people there. Now you think of doing the accounts for a village of that many people. It's not something, oh, I'm doing accounts today. I, I was milking yesterday and tomorrow I'm working in the kitchen. You can't do that. 
work in accounts, you have to do it all the time. So you get professional, uh, which is fine. It's fine to be professional, but it's not the same as being youthful and small. So if we look at the next um, uh, picture, you'll see that it becomes more complicated. And suddenly you have to have somebody full time working on the work roster because there's 100 people to be employed tomorrow morning and they're going to get up at six and there's going to be breakfast has to be ready at eight. And you get the picture. It becomes a lot more complicated and a lot more people working in the administration. And then, of course, you miss out. Oh, it was so nice. We were just a small group. Um, Ruth and I lived for a little while in a community of eight people. I don't think they had a committee. They had the dinner table. And the dinner table served as committee, as a general meeting, as village open meeting, as um, the um, appointment of new members meeting. It was all discussed over dinner. And by the time you'd done the washing up, you'd made the decisions for the next few days. Um, but you got 100 people, you have this kind of stuff that you can see on the wall here. So that's a, a sign of maturity. And of course, people get professional jobs. Um, now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see what happens in a community. This is a community of, actually, the community is 140 people, but it's the kind of hub of six communities in Norway that are all Campbell communities. And there must be about three, 400 people living in those six communities. And twice a year, there is a meeting of everybody who wants to join, and it may be a couple of hundred people turn up. And this is the um, organizing committee for the 200 people meeting of the 2,000 people who are involved in these communities in some way or other. So you see, it becomes more complicated, and you spend more time deciding things together. And, you know, the guys who are doing the milking or, you know, chopping vegetables in the kitchen for 200 people, they're saying, and, and what do you guys do anyway up there in the, in the head office? You know, and they're sitting there in the head office, you know, uh, with their Apple Macs and, and uh, stuff and drinking coffee and making heavy decisions. And you can understand that maturity isn't as much fun as the pioneer, the pioneering stage, but um, it's a bigger, more um, it, it's more complicated, but it has more power. So let's look at the next one now and see what happens when you really get old. Now, Solheimer in Iceland is ninety four years old. Uh, they say they are the first anthroposophical community that cares for people with special needs. And I was there a few years ago teaching a permaculture course nearby, and we went to visit. And this is their visitor center. Nobody lives in this building, but you can see it's quite a big building. They're really proud of it. It's amazingly ecological. It has recycled everything. And you walk in, and the first thing that hits you is two enormous pictures, portrait pictures of two people. One is Rudolf Steiner, who founded Anthroposophy. And the other is Bill Mollison, who founded Permaculture. And it says, these are our heroes. And I was like blown away because those are actually two of my heroes. And it's the first time I've seen them together. Because uh, you, often permaculturists don't like, really like those anthroposophists because they're all weird. And the anthroposophists don't think anything of the permaculture people because they're all weird too. So this is the first time I saw them together. But at 94, you see, you're well established. You can do stuff like this. And uh, it only impresses people. So let's have a look at the next one. Uh, the next picture. Now, this is from a camp hill here in uh, Norway which is an anthroposophical um, community that cares, works with, doesn't care for, it works with people with special needs. And if we have time, I'll tell you a bit about that. This is their sewage system. Now, was, isn't that great, right? I mean, wouldn't you like to have a sewage system like this? I, 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 I drive past them sometimes. I'm sure you guys do too, uh, sewage systems. And you can tell you're driving past because it smells like that. 
and they look like shit anyway and they don't look at all attractive and here um you know it's it's really beautiful it's a it's a pond where all their sewage goes and it's treated biologically and the main problem actually is uh, people who don't know and who go there there are little waterfalls between these little ponds right so they go and wash their hands in the waterfalls before they eat their lunch and uh, you have to say no 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 this is actually a sewage system please don't wash your hands here uh, but you know it looks like this so when you are big and mature you can afford to build stuff like this because your village is big enough to support this kind of project so there is a good thing about being mature and getting older but uh, let's look at the next slide uh, because um people do grow old in eco villages and we used to joke on the kibbutz that the kibbutz is the ideal community for dogs babies and old people the rest of us just work to keep it going uh, because getting old in community is great. I mean, I've seen so many, I've heard so many stories. I've seen so many pictures of how people get old in community. And it's really what we all would dream about and want to do. So this is, this is uh, my partner, Ruth, together with one of the founders of Camp Hill in Norway. Uh, she died ooh, at least 15 years ago now. Um, and she was our neighbor for many years. And she was just such a wonderful person that you just wanted to be, hang out with her. And, and she had so many great stories. So if you want, we can do a whole evening of stories from, from communities. And she has some great stories that she told us and that I, I cherish and I pass them on. Um, but you see here, this development of youth, maturity and old age is a tool which helps us. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, don't take your next picture yet, because the transition from pioneering to mature is painful. I see it in my grandchildren. Uh, the oldest is se uh, 18, 17, going on 18, and she's just getting through that period. Um, her brother is 15, and, you know, it's not easy being 15 and growing up in the country. And I had my things going when I was that age and my children had their things going. And we all know that, you know, puberty, that period is a tough time to go through. Well, that's why your community is having a tough time when it's moving from pioneering to maturity. So let's be gentle with that and, and don't blame ourselves, but say, how do we transition nicely from having being able to do everything in the community to specializing in one thing and honoring the people who do that. Is that a way, is that a way that we can transition nicely there? So it is a tool that may help us. Um, but I wanted to raise a little question for you all. Is there life after death? Now, it's, it's people have been asking this all along, you know, that's one of the things that's kept us going. And I have my own personal beliefs in life after death. And I must say, I'm looking forward to it because uh, it's going to be, it has to be exciting. And if it's not, who cares, you know? Um, but uh, is it life in community after death? And actually there is. You see, that's the secret is that really great communities Next picture now, this is, or you think this is going to be a great picture. Look at that picture. Community outreach. You see, communities have an effect on other people not in community. And if you think I'm talking a lot of uh, crap here, go back to Pythagoras, okay? He did have an effect, and Plato has had an effect on generations since then, and that's two and a half thousand years ago. And if you want to go a bit closer, start reading up on Robert Owen and New Harmony and New Lanark, and you will see that you will be inspired. So one of the things that community is, it reaches out to the surrounding society. And in that reaching out, even though the community may disappear, the ideas live on. So um, let's have a look at the next picture 
while I'm taking up too much. We did start a little late, though, didn't we? Now, making a global impact. Now, you think, well, you know, it's just a few hippies living in a funny little place somewhere up in the north of Scotland. Yeah, who cares? And then I think this was uh, three years ago. Uh, I deliberately made this too small to read because I hate it when people read from PowerPoints. In fact, I often switch off at that point. Um, this was the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report. I think it came out in 2022, so it's two years old. Anybody recognize that picture? Cynthia doesn't recognize it. I okay. do. I do. That's Fintorin. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's Fintorin. What's it doing on the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report? A lot of solar panels. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of solar panels because the very last page of the report is a description of what the future might look like. Mm -hmm. And you could say, I, I, I'm just, I'm not kidding you, I, but I'm not going to read it to you, but it sounds like Findhorn. And the people who put this together, they knew that was Findhorn. Mm -hmm. You didn't pick that out of a, a box. They knew that was Findhorn. Wow. And I'm just saying, Findhorn is on the IPCC sixth assessment report as a picture of the future. I would say we made a global impact on that one. Yeah. Uh, right. So there's another one coming up somewhere. Um, where do we go from here? Yes, this is how this is how I was going to end up my my speech today. Um, and uh, the question is, where do we go from here? Like, if we're interested in living in um, intentional communities or starting them, that's even better. Uh, there's a couple of things you have to know. Many of them don't get much further than a thought, uh, which is fine. Um, many of the ones that get established don't last more than two or three years, which, and we think, oh, yeah, yeah, this is terrible. Oy, what are we going to do with this? You know, like they, they're failures, they're failures. Well, they're not, because the same statistics actually also obtain in business. So most business ideas remain business ideas and don't ever get off the ground. The ones that do start, a large number of them fail within the first two or three years, the vast majority, in fact. So intentional community is actually just a group of people getting together uh, our intention in intentional community is to create a better society, mostly. Uh, business is usually to make money. And so there's a handicap straight away there because you attract money, money seeking people, whereas communities tend to attract people who want to make better communities. It doesn't mean we don't have to make money. Intentional community has to pay its bills. But um, uh, there is this thing that... Um, if we see these as plants, even helping one last for a couple of years will spread ideas and give you that taste of having lived in a pioneering community uh, where, you know, on the kibbutz that I joined in the end of the first year in the newsletter of the kibbutz, and there were about 40 people there then, there was a letter from one of the members saying, have we lost our ideology? Big question mark. We only have rock outs tw three times a week now. What's happened to us? We used to have them every night. And th that shows that, you know, it's such fun because that's one of the things that in, it really um, characterizes being part of a new sprouting plant mm -hmm. called intentional community and i think uh we can just last slide is just a nice slide because it looks nice um but uh we could create community together i've actually gone over my time a little bit since no I no you haven't we we started late we can take as much time as we want now we've already gone off the books <laughs> <laughs> great thank you okay. so much Jan. that was lovely yeah, really, really appreciate um, all of those photos and the little anecdotes you shared and some of the history. I think I, I learned a lot. Like I, I knew about Diggers and Dreamers, the organization in Britain, 
But I didn't realize that the name, I just thought it was a cool name. I didn't realize it had this whole legacy behind it. Oh, so, yeah. it is. yeah, yeah, great. Here, let me get rid of this slideshow. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to frame for people, because some people here are not so familiar with your book, and you've written a few books, but one in particular, I'll hold it up. Growing Eco Communities. You got it too. There we go. And in this book, that's where you go into much more detail into these three different stages of youth mature, maturing and old age and this life cycle of community. And that's the first time I had ever heard of communities having life cycles. Like we have life cycles and the plants do. And that was, um, a powerful concept for me not to think of community living as something that's stagnant, but something that's always changing. Yeah, so that's really great. And also, I like this idea that you pull forward and you talked about it in your presentation, the idea that intentional communities are intentional communities inherently because they're doing something different than the rest of society. And I'll actually read a little paragraph here. Uh, from your book, intentional community has developed in our Western culture as a means of trying out new social forms based on the idea that we can create or design social patterns rather than just inheriting in them. Yeah, so I really, I really like this idea of kind of taking agency and feeling empowered that we don't just need to do the default way of living we can actually create new ways of living or try them out. And they may last 94 years like that community in Iceland or just a few years, or they may just exist as in a, a dream in somebody's head. And it's all valuable because it's all about spreading those ideas. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, and, and uh, 94 years, I mean, they probably just see it as the beginning, you know, uh, those guys in Iceland, uh, they're still going strong. Um, and I, th I think one of the things is that we are not sufficiently aware of our own history mm -hmm. as intentional communards. Yeah. And I, by studying the history, I realized that I am the bearer of um, a message and the bearer of an idea that isn't dying, that's always coming back even though you think you, you can never put it down because we all, some people, there will always be some people who dream of a better world. Mm -hmm. And some of those some people will say, hey, you know, let's just go and do it. Yeah. And that, that saying is so powerful. And I feel that when I'm involved in this, I am carrying on the dream that Pythagoras had, that Gerard Wynne Stanley had, that Robert Owen had, and that there's zillions of them who have had that recently that you all that you know about um, in the last uh, few decades. And we think it's something new, but it's not. It's an old, old thing that's been in. It's built into us. It's part mm -hmm. of our genetics. It's part of our social uh, inheritance. And knowing that makes me feel humbled and powerful. I don't know if you can be the, both of those at the same time, but you know, it's, it's, it's strong in there. Yeah, I can feel it. I can really feel it. Like, yeah, riding on this right. momentum that is millennia old of people dreaming of a better world and saying, let's just do it, make it happen. Yes. Right. And for everyone listening, you know, you're part of that too. We're all part of that, riding on a deep, deep tradition that we get to inherit and carry forward for future generations as well. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Good. Well, we yeah. have, we actually have a lot of questions that are um, coming hey. in. I love so, questions. Yeah. Yeah, we can we can just go go to some of these questions and uh, yeah, we'll see where that takes us. Um, so there were, oh, let's see. So maybe we'll focus first on some of the questions that were pertinent to your presentation. Um, so can you clarify 
what you mean by the transition from a youthful to a mature community, especially regarding doing everything versus specialization. Can you give some examples of what that looks like, that transition from everyone in a community is running around and doing everything, I just had that image, versus more specialization? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's partly to do with things like kids. Um, and it's this is interesting thing. I, I know the history of the kibbutz movement really, really well because I really studied that. And uh, the first kibbutz was just one, one, one little community of about thirty people, and they had a um, a policy: no children, until the secretary of the uh, kibbutz uh, managed to father a child with one of the members, and then they decided to change it that we are now. Uh, we can have kids, but then they had to have children's houses. What do you do with the kids? That like everybody's working, so suddenly part of the work became looking after the children, and that created a whole new branch of activities within the kibbutz and a whole new ide ideology of how do we create a new human being being brought up in community. And um, th that meant that people had to specialize and study child psychology and child development. And they became um, the carers for the children. And the children lived in children's houses. They didn't live with their parents. And it was a whole completely different kind of thing. But it meant, again, specialization, because you had to learn how to do that. Um, and that actually only lasted a couple of generations. And the last children's house of children sleeping in the house, uh, not with their parents, closed in sometime in the mid-90s. And the children then slept with their parents. Um, but it shows that you, you had to become a specialist. And uh, the same is true of things like, you know, the accounts. We mentioned that, that, you know, you're doing accounts. You really have to be on the ball all the time because otherwise you lose track of all those figures. There are so many of them, you know, um, in the accounts, so many numbers. Um, and so you have to be on, on the ball there. And I noticed the same thing that, um, you know, a small spontaneous group will self, often will self-organize. But as a, as a branch gets bigger, it becomes more uh, complicated, more complex. And it's often good to have somebody who is the coordinator of that group, who, has, who manages to check that all these things happen. So for many years, I worked in, I mean, it's terrible to have to confess this, but I worked in high-tech agriculture, uh, making cow food, um, which we sold in the region, we we fed daily a thousand cows, and um, I was for a while the coordinator of that branch, and so I had to know that you know we had to order the food in time so that the mixtures could be made up and made up. We made up every day, and I had to be out visiting clients and had to make sure that all these things happen, and so you get specialization. And then you get that that thing that I, I mentioned that, you know, I'm sitting in the office, you know, racking my brains. How do I get to see all these clients? And so, and so hasn't paid his bills. And, you know, Brian comes in off the tractor and he's pissed off because the tractor's broken down. And he's on his own out there. And, yeah, and why don't you come and help me? And I'm saying, wait a minute, I, I got these clients who are not paying their money, you know. And so it's very easy to get those kind of frictions going. Uh, between the specialized branches and that is a sign of maturity and so using that idea um, is is then um, uh, a way of managing the transition and it's very often that people have this thing about I'm doing all the work because I'm out there with a shovel and you're sitting in the office drinking coffee and you're not doing work. That's a very common thing to have. And that is really a sign of the community becoming mature. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, 
I can pull out many more examples, but let's go to another question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. It's helpful when I think about my community where I live in Vermont, we are just eight households and we don't at the moment have an intention to expand. And we're able to do the kitchen table kind of decision-making that you were talking about. Cause it's like when we've tried in the past to, to implement more structure, it's like, it's too much. It's unnecessary since we're so small. So we're able just to be more organic and it has its pros and its cons, but um, this actually ties in well to the next question. Um, which is about your kibbutz experience. And maybe if you could share just like briefly what a kibbutz is. And and then um, Ida here is asking, why have so many of them changed to manufacturing oriented communities over the years? Or what I understand is many of them have shifted more towards privatization. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm curious about your kibbutz experience. I'm sure there's a lot you could speak to on this. <laughs> Okay, how long have I got? Uh, one <laughs> <Yeah>. hour. <laughs> okay, well, we could go. I think I think we'll go for at least another ten minutes since we okay. started. Ten minutes I'll, I'll be very short then. The kibbutz is a specifically uh, Israeli Jewish tradition, uh, founded in um, the distant past when what is today Israel was a sub. Um, county of Damascus in the Ottoman Empire. And there basically wasn't any kind of uh, uh, law and order. If you wanted to travel in the Palestine of that time, uh, you had to have guards with you because bandits were roaming around. And if you were on your own, they would rob you. Um, and um, a lot of Jewish people were moving there because they were fed up with being uh, pogromed in Russia and stuff. And Russia was then a big empire. It was the Russian empire. And the Cossacks were out, you know, pogromming Jews. That was their, their fun thing to do on a weekend, you know. So many Jewish people went to um, that area of Palestine, which was actually a part of Damascus. And uh, some of them were infused with the ideas of the communists who were then a rising force in Eastern Europe. And they said, hey, why don't we start like communism here? You know, we could do that uh, because basically um, somebody could find a farm and buy it and we'll start a farm and then we'll all work together and we'll be equal. And they called it, uh, first of all, kvutsa, which means group. And then gradually it became kibbutz. And the first one was started in 1910. Um, and then uh, the First World War happened. And after the First World War, uh, there was no longer any Ottoman Empire or Russian Empire. And um, it became the British Mandate. And more Jewish refugees came from Russia because of anti-Semitism there, which somehow or other uh, communism hadn't managed to get rid of. And they were serious communists, these guys. And they said, hey, wait a minute, you just want a small farm? Nah, we're going to make the whole country one big kibbutz. We're going to be a, a socialist state. And we said, OK, OK, OK. But and they got to, you know, a thousand people in some of their communities. and um, And it became a network of communities which developed in the 20s and 30s when there was no state. There was the British mandate and there was no state. And they were really, some of them were good at managing to live peaceably with their Palestinian neighbors, the uh, Arab neighbors, but some of them were not so good. And after the Second World War, then um, the state of Israel was proclaimed, and it was the first time in history that the majority of the people or the vast, a, a large number of the people who established the state were intentional community members who wanted to create a new kind of community. And in fact, I think a third of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence were members of kibbutz. That means members of kibbutz who did not have a salary, who didn't own anything except not even their own clothes because you got the clothes from the clothes store. Um, and they were 
uh, and they didn't have any money. But they were members of kibbutz. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a historical weirdness. Um, but having said that, the politics, I don't want to go into this, but the politics has got uh, steadily worse, I would say, of the state of Israel. And um, the kibbutz has traditionally been to the left and it's traditionally been a, a, a bastion of the peace movement in Israel. Uh, and that is still true today, um, even after what's happened. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that normally there is a um, there is a thing here that I've noticed, and that is that when a community is established, an intentional community started, it is very ideological. In fact, that's mostly what they've got, you know. It's like ideology without a lot of food, so you have to work hard. There's a lot of ideology. Gradually over the years, and I have yet to come across many places which this, where this doesn't happen, the ideology becomes weaker and weaker. Just accept the fact gracefully rather than fight against it. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes weaker and weaker. And uh, I think maybe it's okay uh, because it so it seems to happen. And then there is sometimes an internal revolution and a, a new ideology becomes established. But what's happened to the kibbutz is that they gradually became more manufacturing stuff and people wanted more of their own stuff. And I didn't mention that, but you know, as you get older, you want more of your own stuff. You want more time to yourself. Like, you know, we only have 10 minutes left because I, I want to go and, and, and relax. And Cynthia could go on all night, you see, because she's younger. Um, uh, and I want more private space. That's why I'm sitting in this office, because this is what I've created for myself. My memory's going. So these books and stuff around me, that's my memory. My memory is externalized now. It's great. You know, I can pick it up. It's all around me. Um and I want my own private money. You know, I got fed up with saying, hey, you know, I want to lie on the town with a beer and go and see a film. You know, can I have uh, 10 bucks? Uh, and I say, you know what, J just give me 50 bucks a month and I'll deal with it myself. I don't have to go and explain everything I want to do. I want my own privacy. And that happens in community with the people and in the community. And it's okay because... Why? Because we left the kibbutz 25 years ago because it was going through a really heavy time of privatization mm -hmm. and it was tough and it was really hard. And we said, you know what? Enough already. This is like, how come every time we have a meeting, we go out of the meeting and say, oh, God, we lost again, you know? Um, it was like really hard. And we left and a lot of people left, but not everybody left because some of them, you know, didn't have anywhere to go and stuff. And they carried on and they privatized. And what happened? All the kids came back. And now we left a community of 200 people. Now there's 400 people living there and a waiting list. And a majority of those people are our kids and their descendants and their descendants and it's like five generations and i go back and i think wow this is great the kibbutz is now run by the kids i taught in the 90s to compost and it's now run by a bunch of people who compost all the time you know awesome. uh, so, so there is a thing about privatization but it's okay because actually if you're nice to people and you like them and you support them, then you can you can share your money, but you don't have to. And it's still okay as long as you're nice to them. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the important thing. You know, creating a better society basically is being nice to people. Mm -hmm. you wow. know? Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I like your attitude, it sounds of just accepting the changes in a community and as long as yeah people are nice to each other and also it sounds like the community is taking on a new form but it's thriving because young people are coming back and it's all it's all good it's all just different ways of experimenting and seeing how a community develops over time right um, and I, I didn't tell you and you you actually uh, i maybe i just didn't tell you but I don't live in community any longer. I live just outside the community. Okay. 
And what I found is that we have an unintentional community around us because uh, I'm still trying to be nice to my neighbors. You know, I go and say hi to them. And, you know, if, if I know that they need something, I try and fix it, you know, and, and they lend me stuff. And actually, we have a great time. Uh, and I think that actually the real successful communities are the ones that break up mm. and the individuals go off and are nice to their neighbors. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, that was your, one of your last slides was that outreach. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, I love that. Okay. Um, gosh, so there are a lot more questions about these different models of community. People are asking about Camp Hill and Bruderhof. And I do want to emphasize for people that Jan does get into that in the book, Growing Eco Communities, talks about these different movements of, of intentional communities or movements that were started from communities. Um, yeah, trying to think about what would be best. There's also some questions here about different decision-making models and conflict resolution and what are the best models. But maybe actually, because a few people gave a thumbs up and that's helpful for me, folks, when you give a thumbs up on the comments. So I know which, which uh, questions are popular. Um, would love to hear more about including special needs folks in intentional communities. Because I think a lot yeah. of people aren't familiar with Camp Hill and the work that's been done there. Okay, woof, Camp Hill. Oh, the short story. Right, short story coming up. Um, 1938, Vienna, a bunch of people who were anthroposophists, the followers of Rudolf Steiner, um, they had a study circle there and half of them were Jewish, all of them were intellectuals and all of them were radicals. And in 1938, Hitler, um, uh, or Hitler's armies took over Austria and occupied um, uh, Vienna. And the two things that were not good to be in Nazi-occupied areas in Europe were Jewish and radical intellectual. Those were two things that really doesn't work. So anyway, this group of people left Vienna and their, um, their focus point was a doctor called Karl Koenig and they just went boom out. We got to get out now. Actually, we got to get out yesterday um, because they were being, you know, killed right, left and center um, straight away. And uh, he wrote uh, to, so he said, we're going to meet somewhere. We don't know where. Long story short, uh, he went to Scotland with his family. He was given an old house by a family that knew him, that, that were interested in his, his ideas about anthroposophy and how to care for people with special needs. And they said, you can have this house if you want to start the school that you're talking about for children with special needs. He wrote to any everybody in the group that he could find and said, come to Scotland, we're going to start a school. And they started in 1940. Um, they started the school and um, uh, it was in a house called... Well, he didn't start there. But anyway, they moved within a year to another house called Camp Hill House. So it was called the Camp Hill House School. Mm -hmm. And um, this was the first time that people uh, like doctors and stuff had taken uh, people with special needs seriously. The definition, for instance, of somebody with a Down syndrome, they were called mongoloids, by the way, in those days, was an idiot incapable of being educated. That's the dictionary definition. Mm -hmm. Uh, from that time, from the 1930s, here was somebody who was saying, "Oh, these are these are spiritual creatures who have strange um, bodies, uh, but their spiritual beings are great. You know, they're fine. Let's work with these guys and get the spiritual creatures to uh, flourish." And you know, for parents, 
Think about this. For parents of a child who is definition an idiot incapable of being educated, and here somebody says, wow, this is a great spiritual creature you've got here. We're going to do great things together, you know? And it was like, wow, this was popular. And it became a hit. And so um, more schools opened and, um, you know, they thought it was great. But you know what happens to kids? They grow up. Yeah. That's what happens. And so by the 50s, you know, uh, their parents were saying, hey, like, this is great. Can't they be in school all, the, all, all their lives? And, and Carl Koenig said, no, 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 no. They got to move into villages. And in the villages, we have no teachers. And so they, they started the first village in 56 in, in North Yorkshire. And um, uh, uh, th the whole thing there was to live and work together with people with special needs. And uh, the rest of the history, you can read loads of books about it. Google Camp Hill. So I we lived for a year in one of those villages in the 90s. And then we went back to live full time uh, in 2000. And um, basically, it's not like them and us. It's like us. Mm. Mm. Uh, like, you know, you, we lived in a big house. Uh, it was uh, me and Ruth and our three kids. And then we had uh, six, seven people with special needs. And then we had two or three young co-workers. And there's always a couple of people visiting. So we were like 12, 15 people around the table every meal. And we ate together every meal. And we worked together in different branches and so on. And I started working there teaching permaculture in a school for, for people without special needs. Actually, actually, the real thing is that the Campbell villages are made up of people with special needs and people who don't think they have special needs. Yeah. Because yeah. all have special needs, actually. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so I started teaching permaculture to these um, people without special needs. It was kind of boring, really. And then I said, hey, listen, I want to do a, a thing on ecology with some of the people with special needs. And they said, hey, what do you want to do that for? And I said, well, you know, I want to learn more about ecology. And I, you only learn by teaching, right? So I had to teach. So I said, let me do a, a, a week semester with a week seminar with, with some, a group of people with special needs. And said, yeah, okay, you know, go and do it. And because we were income sharing, you see, you could do anything if they said yes, because uh, you didn't need money, you see. That's, it was great. It's very good. So I did that. I said, wow, this is great. I love teaching uh, ecology to people with special needs because they loved everything, you know. You show them a plant, and they go, wow, this is great. Uh, whereas, you know, when we're educated and grown up, we think, well, it's got to be serious, you know. You've got to have a curriculum and you've got to have standards and marks and stuff. Whereas these guys, they just think, wow, everything's great. So I started teaching them and, uh, and it was so much more fun. And then I did other things. And I moved out because one of the problems you see in communities is that everybody sees what you do and nobody ever understands what I'm doing in permaculture and eco-village design. They think it's crock of shit, basically. So, you know, I was going off and doing permaculture. I come back and say, well, you know, shouldn't you be working in the village with uh, stuff like that? And so in the, in the end, I left and, and we moved out. And so now I can do whatever I want. It's great. Um, uh, but I still work with people with special needs. And it's actually the high point of my week is that I write, I run a writing class with people who can't write. It's great. <laughs> and so you see, the, the whole thing about it is that we, we, we're about five people and we sit together and I say, okay, uh, we're, we're writing the, uh, the, the, the newspaper for the village. And so one of the things is we have this list of rules. So this, these are our um, guidelines. And one of the things is we help each other. And so I say, okay, you know, uh, Hannah, uh, what would you like to write about today? And she can't write. So she says, oh, I'd like to write about uh, the, you know, I, I'm a member of the, of the local brass band. I say, okay, great. Uh, and then I, we write about it, you know, and I write for her and she corrects me and, and so on. And I, and I say to people, look, this is how we work. We help each other, right? Hannah, I could not write this because I don't play any, any brass band. And I said, and you can't write. 
So you can't write about being in a partnership. But when we help each other, we can do this. Nice. And they think it's great, you know, and, and then tomorrow is my, my day for doing this. And so uh, tomorrow, I, uh, the next newspaper is ready now. So now I'm going to take that in with them, uh, to them, and I'm going to go through it with them. And it's about living and working together. Mm. And the most powerful thing that one of them said to me one, once was, uh, she's an autistic woman, and she said, you know, we autistic people we see the world in a different way from you people who think you're normal. And I say, yes. And, I, and she said, you need to see the world through our eyes sometimes because it's actually amazing. Mm -hmm. And you need to see the world in a new way. And I found that so powerful mm -hmm. that um, working with people with special needs actually is the biggest learning thing um, you can do. And just Google Camp Hill. I mean, all you guys are very good at all these things, I'm sure. It's weird. I'm talking to all these people and all I see is Cynthia. You're getting all my attention. Um, sure. But, but, <laughs> but it, you know, Google Camp Hill, because you can be a, a volunteer there for, for a few months, you know. Mm -hmm. And some, some of you are going to really like it. And some of you are really not going to like it. And um, that's how it pans out. And some Camp Hill villages are great. And others are a little bit dysfunctional, just like people, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people are not very well functioning. Well, that's how they are. And that's how it is. Um, and, and some are really functional. And so, actually, the village next to us is having a very hard time now. So... I would classify it as being not so very very, very well functioning. But um, there's another one, two hours drive away, which I love going to visit. And they are an eco village. Boy, are they cutting edge of ecology there. Cool. Uh, and I could talk for hours about what they're doing there. Um, and sewage, love sewage. Sewage is great. <laughs> they have the sewage system. <laughs> great. They have a sewage system. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Good. Yeah, I love um, that encouragement for people to check out Camp Hill. Many of them are often looking for volunteers. It's a great way to start experiencing what community living is all about. Yeah, and and thank you, Jan. I feel like I. I think about like my own answers to like, oh, what's Camp Hill? But you know the whole history and the people and you have it just in your in your brain like an encyclopedia. So I love that. I feel like I've really been learning a lot. And uh, yeah, go for it. I want to say one thing before we end. I'm sort of yeah. scared any minute now that things are going to go blank. We must uh, give a little a plug for the ICSA um, because actually – um it, it's uh I, I can do the plug and you can plug it a bit more as well but in the summer of 2025 we are going to have a face-to-face -face conference in lisbon and one of the things that is definitely going to be uh one of the, the themes of the conference is going to be economics in community but um i'm actually thinking of um setting up a workshop together with a woman called Iris Kunzer, who's a, a German-Austrian researcher in community, uh, about how to find and, and, and set up community. How can we start community? How can we help people find their communities? So we're talking about that as a session. And it's probably going to be hybrid, so it's really easy to access it, even if you don't want to go to Lisbon. But Lisbon sounds like fun. I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, so that could be good. And there's lots of communities to visit there. And we're going to have that too. So if you give a plug to the ICSA website somewhere, I don't know how you do that technically, but I'm sure you're good at that. Sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I put a note in the chat. The ICSA community.org is the website. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. Conference in Lisbon. Portugal. I can give you a plug because you guys who go into that website. She, she. <laughs> yeah she did it she, yeah anyway yeah. Yeah. Cynthia was, did that website and it's great you know yeah 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 so thank, thank you, you for that yeah. yeah absolutely yeah my pleasure to help out with my 
all my skills, tech skills that sometimes work, sometimes uh, not as well. So yeah, fantastic. Good. Well, I know we have a lot more questions that uh, we won't have time to answer, but I do encourage folks to get Jan's book. Um, also, another book we didn't mention, but I'll hold it up as well, Eco Villages, Practical Guide to Sustainable Communities, also has a lot more resources and information. So a lot uh, of knowledge. Both out of print, but oh. um, the this one is still in print. Oh, okay. Like a spiritual approach to permaculture. Oh. And uh, actually what you're seeing there is uh, a thin horn. Yeah, uh, yeah, I see it. So oh. that's, that's, that's still in print. And so is, this is a really boring one. This is the permaculture course. This is how to do it. Um, whereas the spiritual one is all about life after death, you know. <laughs> much more interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jan. Thank you for your time with us and sharing all your stories. I feel like we could keep this going for a lot longer because you have so much to share. I wonder, uh, before we sign off, if there's anything else that you'd like to let people know, uh, some advice you have for them or ways that they can learn more about you. I know we have shared your books and encourage those to check them out, check out the IS ICSA website. Any other parting words you want to leave folks with? No, just just remember, just be nice to people hmm. and, and be nice to the planet too. You know, that's, that's, that, that's really what it's about. Oh, oh you know, yes, it is. Absolutely. Keep it simple. Oh, lovely. Anyway, th thanks for listening to me. And uh, I don't know when I'll next see you, Cynthia, but um, we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe in Lisbon. <laughs> what do you mean, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> I know. I'm already thinking. We, um, I have this Eco Village tour organization, and we've been talking about doing an Eco Village tour in Portugal. So I'm like, oh, how could we weave these things in together? Well, why don't you take them to the conference? I know, exactly. Exactly. Great. Um, Jan, is there a good way for people if they want to stay in touch with you? Are you open to sharing your email address or what would yeah, feel? Yeah, yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Okay. okay. No problem. Yeah. Fine. Good. And, and if, if they want to come to Norway, um I'll I'll show them a couple of eco villages if you want. I mean, I can send them to a couple. Of, I may not go myself, but uh, we have a couple of really great ones here. Oh, so, great. Great. Uh, here. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so anybody interested in Norway? I'm not going to come to the States, uh, probably. Uh, it's um, uh, actually, that's where I met you first. You don't remember, but uh, it was in New Upper New York State. Oh, at the Camp Hill ICSA conference. At the ICSA right. conference, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm really, I, I'm so embarrassed, you know. I'm so embarrassed because I went to one of your sessions. And I fell asleep. And oh, I was no. in the front, and I'm sure you saw me, and I thought, oh, that's it. You know, she, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's why I don't remember. I just tuned you out. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, so, but I probably won't come back because it's a long way, and... Um, yeah, sure. It's, uh, you know, um, yeah, like that. <laughs> but you might come to Norway. Yeah, yeah, could be, could be, so wonderful. Good. Well, I put I put your email address into the chat so people okay. have that. And uh, yeah, I think we'll sign off now. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Jan. Thanks so much. All right. Bye bye. <laughs>